Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Minister for the Economy, and we'll start with listed questions. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for a question. Um, this question relates to an assessment of trends in local mineral prospecting. Northern Ireland currently has 12 active mineral prospecting licenses, 10 for base metals mainly zinc, copper, lead, iron, cobalt and barite, one for diamonds and one for rock salt. In 2009, following the publication of data from a major geological survey, the TELUS project, the number of licenses peaked at 42. These 42 licenses covered 73% of the land mass of Northern Ireland, compared to around 16.6% today. In terms of the number of licenses in place since the peak in 2009, subsequent years have seen a steady decline until 2014, when numbers stabilised and have remained relatively consistent between 10 and 12 uh, or, sorry, between 10 and 20 ever since. It is difficult to consider mineral prospecting licenses in Northern Ireland without the question of gold exploration also being raised. As a reserved matter, consent to explore for gold and silver is given by the Crown Estate and does not require a mineral prospecting license from my department. However, of the 12 licenses currently in place from my department, nine also have options from the Crown Estate to explore for gold and silver. Rachel Woods for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, I thank the Minister for your for her answer. And you will be aware of local community-based campaigns against the exploitation and pollution of our countryside by international corporations. Northern Ireland has a major problem with unregulated mines and quarries and the unrecorded impact that they're having on the environment. According to the latest annual mineral statement published in 2018, a total of 157 quarries were contacted and only 115 responses received. So I'm wondering what steps is the department making to ensure that all information is collected as required under the Schedule 13 of the Mineral Development Act, Northern Ireland, 1969? Sorry. So, um, can I thank uh, the member for um, her statement and question on this issue? Um, it is uh, indeed an interesting area um, for my department and perhaps demonstrates to everyone here the broad range of issues uh, that the Department for the Economy actually uh, covers. Northern Ireland minerals and petroleum licensing legislation are now over 50 years old um, and I believe that they need to be reviewed to ensure that they are flexible to balance uh, the needs of our society and our economic, uh, uh, sorry, and our environmental responsibilities with economic benefit. Um, we all recognise the concerns about the environmental and community impacts of both mineral and petroleum licensing. On the 3rd of February this year, this Assembly declared a climate emergency and called on the Executive to fulfil the climate action and environmental agreements uh, agreed in the new decade and your approach. Equally, my department recognises that access to mineral resources is important, particularly to support the new green technologies that will, require, will be required to help us to tackle climate change. Towards the end of last year, my department began a strategic review of licensing policy, and I fully intend for that work to continue. And in order to inform that review, I've recently given approval for my department to commission independent research in this area. The aim of this research is to develop our understanding of the potential economic, environmental and societal impacts of mineral and petroleum activities and to consider what type of policy and licensing regime we require for the future. I look forward to having that conversation with both the committee and here in the chamber. 
Eirim Sair Emma Sheeran. Gormai Gadas Kankorlia, and thank you to the Minister for her, uh, her answer. Um, it's important that uh, there's caution around the uh, prospecting and mining of precious minerals, particularly in areas where it's not supported by the community. And it's crucial that in issuing licenses for resource extraction that would prevent any further uh, fossil fuels being extracted. Does the Minister have any plans to end the issuing of licenses for petroleum exploration? Well, currently um, we have two uh, petroleum licensing uh, applications. Uh, both of these uh, consultations opened on the 7th of May and closed on the 31st of July 2019. Um, members in this House from their local communities will be aware that there were um, huge um, expectations arising out of this. We received 5,700 responses to the consultation, 2,500 for the application uh, for an area south of Loch Ney, and 3,131 uh, for an area in southwest Fermanagh. Work is ongoing uh, to identify and consider the complex issues and concerns that have uh, been raised. However, it is clear from the analysis to date that the possible environmental impacts and the potential risks to health are the main concern from communities uh, where these uh, licenses uh, are concerned. My department is undertaking a strategic review of petroleum licensing policy, which will include independent research aimed at, better, at developing a better understanding of the economic, environmental and societal impacts this, along with advice from experts in other departments, will help inform considerations uh, of these issues raised through uh, the consultation uh, on them. And therefore, um, in answer to your question, this is the strategic way forward, um, and we will await the outcomes of the consultations and the reviews, and then we will have that discussion within the House here. Mark Durkin, Mark Durkin would, for a question. Uh, I'll ask John Corlea, I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The Minister will more than likely be aware of the huge strength of feeling, indeed opposition, in the Sperrins region to proposed uh, gold mining activities there. While most of these objections will be in environmental in, in, in nature, there are also concerns of an economic impact. Does the Minister have a view on any potential impact that this type of activity could have on existing industries such as the tourism and uh, agriculture sector. I thank the um, member for his uh, question. My understanding is that the Department for Infrastructure is in receipt of a planning application for um, the exploration uh, for gold. Um, and the planning decision, therefore, in relation to um, this exploration is uh, for the Minister for Infrastructure to take. Okay, um, well, let's you all take a break. Um, on the 11th uh, of February, um, as part of the consultation process, the Health and Safety Executive um, submitted an update uh, for uh, this application for gold. It is a controversial subject. It has the potential to impact on communities. It has the potential to impact uh, on tourism. It has the potential to impact on uh, agriculture. But these are planning decisions and generally not for the Department for the Economy. There is also a potential for job creation. However, these decisions cannot be taken in isolation. They should be taken as part of a whole package uh, and therefore, it is important um, that uh, the whole is uh, considered when we look at um, applications for uh, proposed mining. Dear Sir Kelly Armstrong, called Kerry Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, thank the Minister very much for her answers so far. Um, can I ask the Minister um, if she could clarify um, the removal of mineral permissions, as we know, never was really introduced here to Northern Ireland, and we wait on the Minister for Infrastructure to bring that forward, as many of us have quarries in our areas, to be honest, that are extremely concerning. Um, but 
Can the Minister confirm that we actually have people going out from Northern Ireland across the world selling the benefits of mining in Northern Ireland without actually ever considering the impact on our local communities here? So is the Minister in any way surprised whenever um, these mines open that our communities are extremely angry and they don't understand why this is being sold on the world stage? Perhaps the Minister could clarify what communications she's going to have with communities to explain why we're selling Northern Ireland in this way when they're so opposed to it. Um, I will answer this in, in, in two parts. Um, I understand um, that communities um, can be both anxious and um, distraught at the potential uh, for mining within their particular area. The environmental, the planning considerations are not for me to take. And, and I, I think that that is an important thing to say. Um, in terms of the private sector um, pursuing their interest uh, in uh, ex possible exploration in Northern Ireland, those are for private sector interests to take. Um, but I'm presuming as well that the member will be aware um, that there has been some controversy around members from my department taking part in uh, the convention in Canada and the proposal um, to take part in a convention on this very issue in Canada in March of this year. As a new minister just in place, um, I um, have asked for the public interest test to be applied in relation to this um, in respect of last year's uh, conference. Um, and that concluded um, that a future review of this um, was required. Um, I um, will ask my department to review this further, and then we will take an interest to see, is this in the public interest? Is this a value for money exercise for officials from my department uh, to take part in? Uh, and then we will take a decision based on those two issues alone. I call Christopher Stolford. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And on the uh, theme of the public interest, could the Minister give us her assessment of what the need and the demand for these mi minerals actually is? <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. We um, live um, in a, um, at a time when we are progressing um, with new technologies that will require um, minerals in order to progress uh, those technologies through um, to um, their economic benefit. Um, those are technologies around wind power, solar cells, batteries and electric car, which are essential if we are to meet um, zero uh, targets uh, in the future. Modern living also depends on mobile phones, tablets, laptops, all require uh, metals uh, in their production. Lithium, copper, nickel and cobalt are essential to grow our green economy, given the high dependence on battery technology. Northern Ireland may have potential for such min minerals. So therefore, um, there is a requirement um, in our new and emerging technologies uh, and our uh, environmental um, restraints that we need uh, minerals to actually be part of that um, everyday exercise. But we must have a sound basis to develop those policies and that is why I'm asking for a review of licensing um, and further economic research on the societal and economic impacts uh, of mining. We should not um, be going ahead without any of these uh, in place, and it's an area that I intend to take forward in the uh, remaining uh, time in office. Thank you. Here I'm sorry, Jerry Carroll. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister stated there was some 5,000 
uh, consultation responses in, in regard to the application for drilling in the Loch Ness uh, Belfast area, including parts of my own constituency. Um, given that there is considerable opposition to this application, including by my own party, who submitted several thousand uh, oppositions to this uh, and objections to this application, will she give an indication in regard to that and uh, con ongoing concerns about the environment whether she will rule out granting this uh, licence? Well, of course, uh, I couldn't give that um, in uh, this chamber today because the consultation uh, responses are still under reviewed and are going to be informed by further uh, work that my department is doing. Um, we take this issue very seriously. This is not something that we should be doing uh, without good policy and environmental protections in place. I call Mike Nesbitt. Question two. Can I thank the member uh, for his question? Um, this refers to the regulatory environment uh, that would uh, optimise our economic uh, opportunities while also protecting consumers and workers. So I am committed to ensuring our regulatory system optimises economic opportunities for business and commerce while also protecting consumers and workers. <laughs> My business regulation officials are continuing to progress casework and activities as normal. The existing bodies of regulatory legislation, including employment legislation, are already incorporated into Northern Ireland law, and there will be no changes during the transition period that diverge from required EU standards. Any future divergence at our initiative would require consultation and assembly approval for legislation. More generally, I am concerned at the potential for regulatory barriers to trade with our largest market, Great Britain. Great Britain is a key market for Northern Ireland business, with sales of goods to Great Britain representing 48% of total goods sold uh, in Northern Ireland in 2017. Goods purchased from GB during the same time period represented 63% of all Northern Ireland purchases. Um, so I am working hard at the executive and with our government to ensure that our business do not experience fr frictions to trade with GB. And I also wish to protect consumers from any adverse impacts, particularly the most vulnerable, who are at most at risk from rising prices and indeed perhaps restricted choice. Many of the policies which could cause frictions to trade are reserved policy areas, so I'm working to hold the UK government to account on their commitments of unfettered access to the market. Mike Nesbitt for a supplement. Uh, I thank the Minister. The original question was to ask the Minister to what extent the Withdrawal Agreement Act uh, undermined her strategic objective six, namely to deliver a regulatory environment that optimises economic opportunities for business and commerce, perhaps the Minister could focus her next comments on that specific? Well, um, of course, uh, the Withdrawal Agreement Act um, gives us the Northern Ireland Protocol. So therefore, uh, in the Northern Ireland Pro Protocol, the issues that I have outlined are very real, very live, and are fundamental to our economy, absolutely fundamental. Um, in terms of uh, the wider terms of the Withdrawal Agreement Act, of course, what we have is uh, the transportation of EU law into uh, Northern Ireland's law. Um, that means that for the transition period, nothing will change, um, and therefore we remain the same. Under the protocol and the operation of the protocol, um, we would actually remain the same in terms of manufactured goods, and uh, for agri-food. Um, so I am uh, concerned, um, but uh, will be working to ensure that we minimize frictions, that the operation of the protocol does not impact unduly on Northern Ireland's businesses, either in terms of our trade from Northern Ireland to GB or from GB to Northern Ireland. Um, and indeed, I raise this issue um, with um, the Brexit uh, Committee of the Executive and it was agreed um, that uh, this uh, would be a priority for us. 
Um, can I also say that last week I took the time um, to meet with and talk to uh, Connor Burns, who is the International Trade Minister um, in uh, the United Kingdom government. And there I raised with him issues um, that are very important to Northern Ireland, which again are um, part of the protocol and the withdrawal agreement. And that is uh, the issue around our participation in UK trade deals um, and uh, a further issue that is important in terms of trade um, and that is our full participation in the Trade Remedies Authority under the Trade Bill which will soon be coming back uh, to our National Parliament. Call William Humphrey. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Given that the mainland GB is Northern Ireland's largest market, how can the Minister ensure that the unfettered access which the Prime Minister has promised is actually delivered and implemented to business and trade in Northern Ireland? Well, as I have said um, many times, both in committee and now in this House, our most important market and fundamental to the growth of our economy is our market with GB. Um, we do more there um, than uh, in, in any other part uh, of our marketing uh, areas. So it is absolutely vital and important that we protect that trade. The Prime Minister has promised us unfettered access to the United Kingdom's internal market. And this executive, this assembly and these members need to ensure that the Prime Minister is held to account in order to achieve this unfettered access um, to our most important market. Um, the United Kingdom government has uh, committed to including the executive on the delegation for the joint committee, which will look at these trading issues. Um, and we need to ensure that we are maximizing our influence in that forum. I understand uh, that the Prime Minister has also written to uh, the First and Deputy First Ministers and indicated that he will be holding to his promise of unfettered access. Call Jim Allister. Thank you. How can you optimise the economic opportunities if access to and from our biggest market is fettered? And whereas the hyperbola of the Prime Minister might be very soothing, is it compatible with the cold print of the withdrawal agreement? Can I thank the member for his question, uh, which gets uh, to some very, very important uh, points. Um, it is the Prime Minister's promise to Northern Ireland that there will be unfettered access. It is up to us to ensure that he is held to his promise on unfettered access. I, unlike the member, um, will take not uh, the European Union view uh, on this, uh, but I will work with uh, my own government in London to ensure that that unfettered access is uh, a reality. It is a fact and it is um, absolutely undeniable. It is the most important thing that we can do to ensure that the fundamentals of our market access are secure uh, to Great Britain. And as to uh, the hyperbole of the Prime Minister, it is not for me, nor do I have the time nor energy um, to um, actually engage in that uh, kind of philosophical uh, debate today. Iram Sir Matthew O'Toole for your cash. I call Matthew O'Toole for a question. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, going back to the initial premise of the question, objective six in the department strategic plan um, says that the Department of Economy work to have more people in better paid jobs. It also talks about a more competitive, balanced economy. Will the minister agree that what the prime minister or what the um, Home Secretary announced last week in terms of um, new immigration rules? flies in the face of that. It's an appalling um, set of proposals which will damage the Northern Ireland economy. And will the, Prime Minister, will the Minister also reflect that it's another set of broken promises from the government in London? 
Can I thank the member for his question? Um, more and better jobs is indeed uh, a primary objective of my department. Um, and since I became minister, I was delighted um, to announce 85 jobs uh, in connection with Microsoft. And just on Friday in Coleraine, a further 155 jobs um, at a local um, uh, business there. Investing in jobs is investing in people, investing in families, investing in communities, and that is fundamental uh, and something that I hold very, very dear. Um, in terms of the immigration um, rules and, and proposals that were set out last week, um, we, I think, can agree that uh, with business uh, and business representatives um, that the salary threshold is indeed a problem for Northern Ireland. Um, and while I have absolutely no desire to make Northern Ireland a low-wage economy uh, appealing to the lowest common denominator uh, of the market, um, I do think that on an average uh, the salary threshold um, is, is an issue for Northern Ireland. Many of our key industries, tourism, an industry that is thriving in Northern Ireland, rely on people who come and live and work amongst us. Um, and therefore, it is important that we are able to retain those people. And perhaps one of the issues that isn't often talked about, and you refer to the competitiveness of our economy, which is absolutely hugely important, is the fact that we also share a land border with an uh, um, EU member state um, where immigration control will be much, much less. And uh, I do not want our economy and the competitiveness of our companies and our economy to be impacted uh, by those uh, issues. So therefore, again, um, the, I understand that as an executive we are writing, we are expressing our concerns uh, to the Prime Minister uh, and hoping to meet on uh, these issues in the reasonably near future. Here is Sir Kiva Archibald, Van um, and I thank the Minister for her responses uh, so far and referring back again to um, strategic objective number six. There was a law centre event on Brexit and employment rights here in the Assembly today. Um, given that the withdrawal agreement protocol on Ireland commits to no diminution on rights, safeguards or equality of, of opportunity and that employment is a devolved matter, does the Minister agree that we must continue to meet at least the EU standard going forward and look to strengthen employment rights? Gormelga. Can I thank uh, the member for a question? I suppose, really, I would say that one of the things that um, always, as someone um, who has spent a lot of time in the European institutions, is this idea that we as a nation and as a country are not um, sympathetic enough, democratic enough, uh, or aware enough uh, to ensure that we have appropriate and uh, proper uh, employment rights uh, on our own. Um, and I think that that is something that we should reflect on. As I say, the body of European law has now been transposed uh, to uh, the United Kingdom uh, and therefore applies in Northern Ireland. This is an area that my department has responsibility for um, and I, of course, will be keeping uh, a close eye on it. Can I say that since becoming Minister, um, I have introduced the Early Conciliation Service, which I think is a benefit um, to uh, employees in resolving issues uh, that have been, become protracted and difficult. Um, and I also, obviously, as most people know, wish to br uh, bring forward the rights uh, for parents who have been bereaved. But those are, only one of a num those are just a few of a number of areas that I will be keeping a watching brief on and working with my officials to ensure that we have appropriate, sensitive uh, and uh, legalist, legally um, watertight employment laws. Thank you. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if she will give a clear commitment to fully implement the Withdrawal Agreement Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, I will um, commit uh, today to working with our government to ensure that the protocol um, is not, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm always struck by some members who want to make this and tie us up in EU law and EU legislation forever and a day. Um, the protocol is something that we should use to make sure 
that our economy is not hindered by any of the issues uh, that I have talked about uh, around uh, access to trade, access to trade um, agreements, um, and, acts, and that we do not uh, put barriers up uh, to our most important uh, economy in the rest of uh, the United Kingdom. Our access to the United Kingdom's internal market is absolutely fundamental. As well, I will be encouraging our cross-border trade, I will be encouraging our trade with the rest of Europe, and of course I will be encouraging our trade with the rest of the world. Um, these are all fundamental uh, opportunities. We must uh, see uh, the situation that we are now in as one where we guard against problems and look for opportunity. Okay, that ends question. We now move, now move to topical questions and just to advise members that numbers four and seven have been withdrawn. And uh, Iram Sarnish, your Colum Gildenew. I call now Colum Gildenew. Gormay Agat, Las Kian Corlia. Can I ask the Minister, has she set a time frame for the implementation of the Working EU Work Life Balance Directive, which was approved by the EU Council in June 2019? Column Gildenew for Hunya Cash Dorlinta, supplementary question to Column Gildenew. Would the Minister recognise and agree with me that working carers are some of the most disadvantaged in our society and are struggling to, to juggle their carrying responsibilities along with accessing, retaining, and protecting their progression in work? Can I therefore ask the Minister, can I therefore ask the Minister that she does consider implementing that directive as speedily as possible? Can I um, say that I agree that uh, we need to take care uh, of those uh, amongst us uh, who work in, with the vulnerable, um, who work um, in difficult uh, occupations, and that we also provide a proper uh, work-life balance uh, for people uh, in those throes. I know what it's like to be a carer. It is a difficult um, position for people to be in and often demands are 24-7. Um, so I do understand the issues um, from a personal perspective. Um, and while um, we will look at all aspects uh, of employment law, it uh, is important uh, that we recognize the fundamental principles. I've said in this house um, on my last question time we should also not just aim to have a legally watertight system, but we should aim to have a compassionate system. Call Paula Bradley for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what plans um, her department are putting in place to celebrate the centenary of Northern Ireland next year? Can I thank uh, the member uh, for her question? Um, next year is um, a very significant year for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland will be 100 years old. Uh, and while we will celebrate um, a past century, we will look forward to a future century of progress uh, in uh, this part of the United Kingdom. Um, as uh, the Minister for the Economy, we have been reflecting on this very important milestone uh, within uh, our community. At the turn of the last century, Northern Ireland led the way in shipbuilding, in linen manufacturing, um, in uh, rope works, and Belfast was a hub of manufacturing activity. Today, Northern Ireland leads the way in fintech, in cybersecurity, in new digital technologies. And um, in my own constituency, um, I was reflecting that we are due to have a, a new uh, visitor attraction uh, from a renowned uh, and very famous um, production company um, situated in an old linen mill, when where we have married uh, both the past and the present. So I've been thinking on these lines. I think we have a great story to tell. And I want to see us produce some tourism projects to use the opportunity to market Northern Ireland further on the world stage. Um, and when I go uh, to America later, or sorry, in March, um, I will be doing that to a number of new companies. And also, I think it's an opportunity not just to look at tourism, at look at the economy, 
but to provide skills for our young people so that we can grow and provide the proper skills to match the future for the future of Northern Ireland. Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the Minister for her answer to that question. Coming from a very strong East Belfast family that worked in the shipyard and the rope works, I'm very glad to hear, I'm very glad to hear we've moved on considerably since then also. Um, but I just want to uh, hone in on what the Minister was saying about skills for our young people. They are our future, and they're the future for Northern Ireland going forward in the next century. Can you please give an undertaking to ensure that we do our utmost best by our young people in upskilling them in those skills that we need? Can I thank uh, the member for a question? It is important um, that as we think of Northern Ireland's um, centenary, we also think of the future, that we allow people to celebrate um, in all of our communities, uh, both old and new, to this part of the world, and also that we build for the future. The skills agenda is one which is um, huge uh, in my portfolio. I recently attended um, a wonderful showcase for our apprentices and our higher level apprentices. So I want to see us develop more skills um, that are relevant to our economy going forward. And skills that not just help people into work, but skills that will help them develop along their journey of work. And this is the way that I think that we can make our community stronger, more prosperous, and we can have a more inclusive and stable Northern Ireland. Sir Jerry Carl of One Cash. I call Jerry Carl for a question. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome the Minister's recent uh, comments when she stated that students should not be uh, priced out of university, especially given her party leader's recent uh, pronouncements on this issue. Can we take this as an indication that she will not support raising tuition fees here? Well, of course, um, if you had read the full text of uh, my party leader's work, you would have seen that that's not what she said. But anyway, we'll not get in the way of a, a good story on that one. I um, want uh, to see us widening opportunity for all of our communities. Um, and that is an important and fundamental aspect of the work that I will do. I don't want to see students priced out of education so that when we talk about reviewing university uh, funding, we shouldn't pick on students as the one aspect of it um, that we can drive uh, for higher um, prices and better margins. We will be reviewing uh, the whole aspect uh, of higher uh, and for, indeed further education funding um, in the next uh, year, um, 18 months. And therefore, it's important that we look at in the round and in the whole. Um, I want to see um, opportunity and education advanced to all communities. And I think it's important that I stick by that comment that I don't want to see anyone priced out of uh, education. Jerry Carroll, a supplementary question for Jerry Carroll. I thank the Minister for her response, but it is disappointing that she didn't rule out the fact that tuition fees won't go up in this uh, period of the sitting of the, of, the uh, of the Assembly and her term ahead. Does she think it's fair uh, that people who availed uh, of free education can therefore uh, tell our students that they have to be uh, landed with a mountain of debt when they come out of university themselves? Um, since that can only be directed at people of my <laughs> generation and, 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 and era, I will answer it personally. For me, I was the first in my family to go to university. University and education opened up a huge number um, of opportunities to me. And it's something that I personally um, think should be extended to all young people in the future. And therefore, um, I am committed to taking forward a review on a fair basis, not pricing people out of education, not um, looking to saddle youngsters with debt that will stay with them for a very long time to come. Um, but we must look at these issues in the round and in the whole and uh, arrive at a conclusion that we can all be satisfied. We also have to allow our universities to advance and grow and progress as well. So there is a balance to be struck 
But if we keep the principles in mind, I think that we can come to that very, very fair uh, balance at the end. I asked the Minister when she will approve Derry City and Strabane District Council strategic outline cases for two innovation and two digital projects which are currently on her desk. Um, those issues uh, are currently working their way through the system um, and when they come to me in the fullness of time we will look at them in the round. Supplementary question for Karen Mullen. I thank the Minister for her response and given the Minister's earlier answer on this new centenary mm -hmm. and looking to the future and development skills, uh, she, she will understand these are very important projects for Derry, Strabane and the wider North West and in keeping with commitments to target resources on the basis of, of objective need and to tackle regional disparities laid out in both the programme for government and the new decade new approach, I would urge the Minister to give a time frame for a decision on these proposals. Again, can I thank uh, the member for a question. Um, I think it has been clear to anyone who has read um, some of my comments recently um, that I am committed to building an economy across Northern Ireland for all of Northern Ireland and all of its communities. That includes the North West, the South West um, and all uh, parts of Northern Ireland. So I think um, that it is important that I state that again today and will progress the issues that she raises um, in as timely a manner as we can. Here I'm sorry, Lawrence Kelly for the case. They called Lawrence Kelly for a question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you will be aware of the financial hardship impact on over 400 business here uh, on the advertisement deals uh, involving Viewable Media UK Limited and Granka. Notwithstanding the fact there is an uh, ombudsman investigation, could you outline what support your department may give in the interim and over the longer term? Can I thank the member for her question? This is indeed an issue that her colleague spoke to me about um, last week. Um, and I have passed this over to uh, officials for a review. And as soon as we have conclusions, I will uh, commit to talking to both you and to your colleague uh, to ensure that we have a way forward, if there is a way forward that my, uh, we can identify and, and work with. Um, it is, um, and it seems, uh, quite a, a scandal that this has gone on for quite some time. But we are working on it. I got the information last week, and I will come back to you and talk to you when it is available to me. Could I uh, thank the Minister for, for her response and for her commitment? I uh, could ask the Minister then, uh, not only to meet with ourselves, but in, in relation to the stakeholders, I think some of them were up here uh, last week campaigning, and I think it's very important we understand the fine level of detail that does impact on, on what really are very difficult times for our business that are struggling? No, I accept that completely and um, as soon as we have looked at and worked through the issues, I'll come back and talk to you and we can meet with whatever groups uh, are necessary. That is not a problem. Here, sir, Trevor Lund, for your case. I call Trevor Lund for a question. Last time call you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Would, would the, could the Minister give us an assessment, if it's possible at this time, of the likely impact on local business of the new immigration regime which has been proposed by the UK Government? I appreciate that you answered a question in a similar vein, which wasn't actually part of the question that was asked in the first place, so maybe she could answer mine. Um, well, so we do want uh, to make sure um, that as we go forward, um, in this new area, era, um, independent of the European Union, that um, we maximise opportunity, um, but that we also um, try to limit uh, any of the difficulties that are uh, towards us. Um, obviously, um, we are in a very fluid and uh, new situation in relation uh, to uh, the immigration rules. I have listened very carefully to um, business, to the service sector, to tourism, to the healthcare sector, um, where there are many um, issues um, around uh, the level uh, of wage control that there, that there will be. 
But I think that there is also opportunity um, to ensure that we do not sink to the lowest common denominator in relation to our wage economy. So the situation is new, the situation is fluid, and when we have conducted um, the impacts, then uh, we will make uh, any of that advice available. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, you should be aware of the, the Home Secretary's figures for economically inactive people that were uh, announced over the weekend, which have been largely rubbished by everybody in sight because they're so utterly inaccurate and preposterous, not worth consideration. They include carers, students and retired people who are expected to take on the jobs of immigrants. Would you agree with me that that is quite ridiculous and that there might be a case even so for differentiation in terms of Northern Ireland? Um, I understand um, the member's um, question around the economically inactive um, and it is an issue that um, I will have to grapple with uh, in terms of the department. Um, we still in Northern Ireland have a relatively high economically inactive um, percentage in the population and therefore I want to see more people um, back into work and I want to see more flexible routes to get people back into work. However, that does not take away from his very basic and valid point that many of those people who are described as economically inactive are people who um, perform incredibly important caring roles, are students, uh, or um, have a disability. Um, so that there are very fundamental challenges in relation to this. I have already set out um, concerns around the salary level uh, for those people uh, coming to Northern Ireland. And I think that this is one of the areas that we can make representation to um, in, uh, with uh, our government. Um, and I know that the First and Deputy First Minister have committed to doing this. That concludes our business now. I thank the Minister. And we must now move to questions on education with the Minister for Education. Uh, I guess Aram Sir Kiva Archibald.